Towards the end of Queen Elizabeth's reign and continuing thereafter, there was a t- determined effort on the part of the English crown to populate Ireland with English subjects. Scots and English were transported in large numbers to Derry in what is now Northern Ireland by the plantation of Ulster. Huge swaths of land were taken from the Irish and given to the Scottish and English settlers. Unlike previous invaders, these Protestant landowners were not about to be assimilated with the impoverished, angry population of Irish and and Anglo-Norman Catholics. During this period, between 1614 and 1619, the town of Derry, also known now among Protestants as Londonderry, built its famed town walls, which are still completely intact today. Meanwhile, the anger of the locals festered, and eventually a group of about 5,000 Irish Catholics launched a rebellion in Ulster, in which they massacred a number of Protestants. This massacre has become a cause celebre of the Protestants. The Irish Catholics allied themselves with the Catholic King Charles I in the English civil wars against Cromwell. Once Cromwell was victorious in England, he launched an attack on Ireland in 1649 and massacred many locals in the Battle of Drogheda. Cromwell declared that all Irish Catholics that owned land were to be dispossessed of their land and transported to Shannon in the west of Ireland. It was at this time that the property on which the Beaulieu House now stands near Drogheda was taken from the Plunkett family and given to one of Cromwell's Protestant friends. Later, when Charles II was restored to the throne, he failed to restore the Catholics to their lands, largely because the restoration had been accomplished with Protestant help, and he gave the Beaulieu property to the Protestant Sir Henry Tichborne, who built the present house on the foundation of the Plunkett's home in 1660. Ten generations later, this house still remains in the same family, having passed down through the female line as each generation passed. As the present owner has a child and grandchild, there have been 12 generations of this family occupying the same house. Bolia was among the very first of the landed homes in Ireland to have been built without fortifications. Over the ensuing years, the landed gentry, mostly Protestant English, displaced the many minor kings that had ruled Ireland from their castles. These new landlords built great mansions all around the country. In some cases they lived in the mansions, but often they became absentee landlords living in London with property managers running their estates in Ireland. Among the mansions we visited were Powers Court Estate in County Wexford, Kylemore Abbey, built as a country estate in the 19th century and converted to an abbey during World War II, Westport House in County Mayo, built in 1730. The strange Frederick Hervey house built by the eccentric Bishop of Derry in 1774. The house burned in 1851, was rebuilt and then allowed to fall into ruin after World War II. Nearby on the same estate, Hervey built the Musinden Temple to house his library and his mistress, who was also mistress of Frederick William II of Russia, a Prussian. In 1681, Catholic James II took the throne of England and repealed the Cromwellian land settlement, but in 1688, Protestant William of Orange overthrew James in England. James was still King of Ireland, 
and he dispatched a reg regiment of Catholics to take Londonderry. Rumors grew among the Protestants that the Catholics were planning a massacre, and 13 young Protestant apprentice boys took the keys to the walls and locked the gates against James' troops on December the 7th, 1688. The bishop's gate, shown here, was the last one locked by the lads. The siege began, and the cry of no surrender has become the Protestant watchword ever since. The apprentice boys' bodies are now buried here in the graveyard adjacent to St. Columns Cathedral in Derry. The siege was eventually broken by William of Orange in July 1689, after waiting several months before being willing to get involved. The Protestant Irish still remember having been left on their own and still feel they are a small mon minority which has to protect itself from the evil hordes surrounding them, despite the fact that they are a majority in Northern Ireland. In 1690, William of Orange won a great battle here at the Boyne River, County Meath, and by 1691 all the Catholic armies had surrendered. This is the foundation of the, quote, orange over green, close quote, that Irish Protestants still perpetuate to this day in the 12th of July celebration of the Battle of the Boyne. Several years later, the first penal laws were enacted against the Catholics, making it illegal for friars and bishops to practice and forcing priests to register. Curiously, over most of the next hundred years, most of the pressure for Irish independence from England came from the Protestants, not the Catholics. There were a variety of skirmishes between Catholics and Protestants over the period, but the main thrust for independence was from Presbyterians led by Wolfe Tone, who invited the French to invade Ireland in order to drive out the English. The bad weather prevented the French fleet from landing in Bantry Bay, County Cork, and the English then crushed the uprising. But for the weather, the French would probably have succeeded in their invasion, and Ireland's history would likely have been quite different. Today, Bantry Bay is the site of the beautiful Garanish Island. The entire island was purchased by a wealthy family and turned into a botanic garden, which is now open to the public. a second invasion by the French, but the endeavor was discovered. Wolf Tongue was arrested and eventually committed suicide in prison. In 1800, the Act of Union united Ireland and England, and the Irish Pop Parliament was absolved. Around this time, Daniel O'Connell became a mass political movement of Irish, began a mass political movement of Irish Catholics by preaching to ever-expanding crowds with the largest monster meeting occurring on August 15, 1843 on the Hill of Tara, the spiritual center of Ireland which had been home to the early Celtic kings and generations and generations of people before them going all the way back to the Stone Age. O'Connell Street in Dublin is named after this man. Daniel O'Connell's movement lost steam when the potato famine, famine hit Ireland in 1845. Most Irish Catholics lived off a single crop, the potato. The other crops they grew were exported by the landed gentry to pay for the rents for the tenant farmers. When the potato crop failed, the rents still had to be paid and the other crops still had to be exported, so the population began to starve. Meanwhile, the British government, not wanting to interfere with the, quote, market system, 
refused repeatedly to distribute food imported for that purpose from America and refused to allow the locally grown cops to be consumed in Ireland. The result was a preventable mass starvation with those not starving being forced to emigrate to America and elsewhere. One of the major embarkation points was Cove Island near Cork. From here, more than two and a half million people emigrated. It's hard to imagine now what this island must have been like with the tens of thousands of starving Catholics waiting their turn to board the ships. Between 1841 and 1851, the population of Ireland fell from 8,175,000 to 6,552,000. In the latter part of the 19th century, liberals in England gradually sought to weaken the English rule over Ireland, and there was increasing pressure for a home rule bill, but this was successfully blocked by the conservatives who were egged on by the Protestants in Ulster. In 1903, a Land Purchase Act enabled Irish tenants to purchase their land and provided loans to make that possible. In 1909, another Land Purchase Act forced the landlords to sell. Nevertheless, Ulster Protestants continued to block all home rule measures and eventually liberals began to accept the idea of excluding Ulster from any home rule bill. Irish nationalists becoming increasingly, in, increasingly impatient with the pace of change launched a rather ill-planned Easter Rising on Easter Day in 1916. They took over the General Post Office in Dublin as well as St. Stephen's Green, among other targets, and killed a number of people in the process. The British brought in reinforcements and slowly recaptured the heart of Dublin, killing a number of civilians in the process. Many of those captured during the Easter Rising were imprisoned here at Cork City Jail. Later, the British released many of the people involved in the Easter Rising at a goodwill measure, and these gathered together to form a group led by Michael Collins, calling itself Sinn Féin. In the 1918 elections, the Sinn Féin party won an overwhelming victory, immediately convened Parliament in Dublin, and declared Ireland a sovereign, independent republic. Skirmishes continued for several years until a treaty was signed with England in 1921, giving most of Ireland independent status while retaining much of Ulster for the crown. That concludes our pictorial summary of Irish history. Some of the other sites of our trip will follow without narration. Enjoy.